Thank you, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, a bit of a disclaimer. I was at Vegan Camp Out last weekend. I'm obviously getting too old for partying. I managed to get, my, get myself COVID while I was there. So if I get a bit out of breath or my voice breaks, don't worry. I'm just getting over COVID. That's all it is. But the wonderful thing is I'm vegan, so I've got an amazing immune system. So I'm going to be absolutely fine. OK, so let me share my screen. Okay, I will go. Okay, so hopefully this all works. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you about vegan publishing tips. Um, and this is quite important because I think because when you're vegan, whether you're vegan for the animals, whether you're vegan for health, whether you're vegan for sustainability and biodiversity reasons, it's something that you become very passionate about. And one of the key ways of influencing other people is by becoming an author. There's something about becoming an author that makes people take you seriously. Even your nearest and dearest family members start to take you seriously if you're a professionally published author. OK, so that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Now, before I get into that, who am I? I know there's quite a number of you here who do know me. I've, I saw some faces that I recognize, but there's also lots of people who don't know me. Um, now, my, I'm the founder of The Vegan Publisher. I became vegan in 2012 because of this little lady. Um, she turned up in my life in 2010. I didn't even want her, I'll be honest with you. I'd never had any animals. I never lived with any animals, I should say. Uh, my family wanted her. I envisaged a house full of fur. I was correct. The house is full of fur all the time. But within about a week or so, I witnessed so much sentience and intelligence. It, it dawned on me that we have to believe these beings are not sentient. They're not intelligent. They don't think the way we do. They don't feel what we feel. Um, we have to think that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do all the incredibly horrific things we do to them. You know, we wouldn't hunt them. We couldn't farm them. We, we couldn't test on them. We couldn't do all these awful things. So that started my transformation into becoming vegan. I went vegan in 2012. Um, and since then, I'll go quite fast here. I have this affliction where I just need to hug and stroke every animal that I see. Um, I can't help it. I do see it as an affliction, but I just can't help but just be around these beings all the time. Now, my background is in journalism. I was a journalist over 20 years ago. And then I moved on from journalism into a content writer and a ghostwriter. So I wrote articles, blog posts, sales pages, landing pages, emails, social media posts, and books for a number of different businesses around the world. So that's what I did for a, a number of years. And I would notice that the piece of written content that made the biggest difference to people was a book. That was the thing that would get them onto that podcast that they really wanted to get onto. That was the, the piece of content that will get them onto a radio show or a TV show. It will net them that client that they really want or put them in front of an investor that they really wanted to invest in their business or brand or nonprofit, whatever it was. So I decided that I really wanted to specialize in books. And I also wanted to marry it with my love of veganism, and by, I got into veganism because for the animals, but anyone here, I'm sure anyone who's been vegan for more than I would say a couple of years, you might get into it through one or more channels such as health or animal rights or you know the environment. But once you're in here, you start to learn all the other ways that being a vegan makes you just a great person. And I started to learn that veganism was great for my health. I started to learn that veganism was great for the planet as a whole as well. And I just thought this is what I really wanted to do. And therefore, the vegan publisher was born. And I wrote my own books. So I'm a ghostwriter of seven books. But then when I founded the vegan publisher, I realized I needed to write a book of my own because I've got all these books out there. And yet my name's not on them because I wrote them for other people. So I wrote the Freedom Mass Plan designed for vegan and ethical experts, influencers and entrepreneurs. And it's all about showing them how to use a book. It's not just a case of writing a book and sticking it on Amazon. Some of you may be authors here who've done that. And you'll, you'll vouch for me here that just writing a book 
doesn't read you anything. It's how to leverage a book in the correct way to build your brand and get the attention that you deserve. What was wonderful is with this book being quite niche, not only is it aimed at vegan plant-based ethical experts, but it's not even vegan or ethical people. It's people who created a brand, whether it's a business or a nonprofit. So it's a much smaller group of people. Despite that, I think I hit a nerve because it ended up going to number one for all of its categories in the UK, also in the US, and even in Australia. I don't actually know that many people in Australia, so I don't know how I managed that, but I was really, really happy. But the biggest accolade that I got, one that really, really just made me feel like, wow, this, this has made a difference to people, was I was nominated for a VegFest London Award last year. Um, and there was over 20 books that were nominated. I came third. As far as I'm concerned, I came first because all the other books were aimed at people who are either vegan or transitioning into a plant-based lifestyle. My book is for people who are vegan, ethical, and have a business or a nonprofit or a brand of some sort. So a much smaller group. Um, so to come third nationally was just incredible. And because of that, I ended up all over the place. So you could see my face on Vegconomist, in Plant Powered Planet magazine, uh, in Plant Based News, in New Mexican Vegan. I was also in the Irish Times dressed up as Courage the Vegan Mermaid. There's a whole story there. We don't have time to go into it. But I mean, anyone who's interested as to why I was an Irish mermaid, just send me a message and I'll tell you the whole story. I was on Chef AJ's show. I'm sure you, some of you recognize this incredible lady, Jane Velez Mitchell, long-term animal activist. Um, bit of a pinch me moment to have Jane waving my book in the air and telling all of her followers to go and get it. So because I wrote a book, I was able to get this kind of publicity in a very short space of time. And this is exactly what my clients have done as well. So I've published 29 authors. I'm working with 57 right now. I'm not going to go through all my authors. We're going to be here for hours. But I'm just going to give you a few people just to give you an idea. So Amanda is the author of Dare to be Fair. Uh, she is vegan. However, book is actually not, not to do with veganism. Her cause is helping women in the UK understand that they're not getting paid what they should be getting paid. The average woman in the UK gets paid 80 pence to the pound that the average man gets. I think it's similar in the US as well. Um, and her book is all about empowering women to get paid fairly. Um, then we have Bobby. Bobby's based in New York. And her book, Freedom from a Toxic Relationship with Food, is all about how to get rid of bulimia and anorexic tendencies. She battled anorexia and bulimia for over 40 years. The only thing that stopped her from starving herself was by going whole food plant-based. She realized that when you eat whole food plant-based, you can't be overweight. You physically can't be overweight. You'll be the exact right size that you need to be. So her book is all about that. Um, Sandra Nomoto, some of you may know her, um, she is a vegan copywriter and content writer. So she's written a book about how vegan businesses can market for success. And Tiffany, Tiffany is somebody who's been published very, very recently. Um, I love Tiffany because she's very different from the other, the other people. Most of the people who come to me tend to have a brand, a nonprofit or a business, and they want to use their book to get tons of visibility, get into the papers, get into podcasts, get onto major YouTube shows, that sort of thing. Tiffany came to me, she's in a small group of authors who don't want any of that. She actually has a nine to five job and is not interested in leaving her nine to five job. She's very happy, but she just wanted to be taken seriously by her nearest and dearest who would dismiss her when she would talk about the benefits of being vegan, the benefits of having a plant-based lifestyle. So she wanted to write a book to show her nearest and dearest that she's serious and they, they need to listen to her. And I love that because I thought that's, to me, that is all of it is activism. Sometimes activism is big. Someone like Dr. Silas Rao, he's big on activism. People around the world know him. But we have a saying that charity begins at home. Well, guess what? Activism also begins at home. And you might have smaller aspirations, such as Tiffany. She just wanted her nearest and dearest to just listen to her. And maybe that's all you need to do. And writing a book can help you do that as well. So whether you have huge aspirations or small aspirations or somewhere, somewhere in between, a book is usually a really, really great way of getting there. 
So just to show you, give you examples. Again, I'll be here all day if I give you all the examples. So just a, a smattering of examples of what happened. So Amanda, she ended up in the Financial Times. Some of you may be aware, a worldwide financial paper. Now, Amanda's great at what she does. I would say that I'm her publisher, but she is a great financial advisor. However, there's over 5,000 here in the UK. I think 5,100 or more financial advisors here in the UK. What is Amanda so great at that other financial advisors, well, what's so different about her? Is she really that better as a financial advisor than the other over 5,000 that we have in the UK? No, she isn't. But the reason she ends up in the Financial Times is because she's an author. That's really the only differentiating point. Sandra, who you also um, was introduced to just a little bit earlier, she ended up on nationwide Canadian TV. I thought it was statewide, but then she corrected me and said, no, I was on breakfast TV nationwide in Canada. Now, again, Sandra is a very talented writer. Don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of content writers and copywriters in the world. They're not on TV. What's the differentiating point? What, what made her get onto this show? It was a book and you can actually see she's got a book on the left hand side on the table as well. Luke, now Luke isn't vegan. I know, boo, hiss. I do actually work with people who are not vegan, who are ethically or sustainably minded, because my belief is with working with me, they end up becoming vegan. Luke is about 90% plant-based now. And so I know I've had effect on him. He's actually written two books with me. Now, Luke is a fitness instructor. So far, so boring. How many fitness instructors are in the UK? I literally don't know. There must be tens of thousands in the UK. And globally, there must be millions of them. Why is he getting paid to go around Europe and give motivational speeches? Is he actually any better as a fitness coach compared to other fitness coaches? Probably not, but he's the author of two books and that's a differentiating point. And I include myself here. Now this happened uh, about three months ago. Um, I nearly fell off my seat when I saw this. I was invited down to the Houses of Parliament. Um, I, along with 120 other businesses, we signed a pledge with a charity called the League Against Cruel Sports. And the pledge is to end animal hunting and animal fighting by 2025. So we've all signed this pledge and we were told, hey, can you make a 30 second video just saying why you support this pledge? We all did it, over a hundred businesses, we um, did it. Imagine my surprise when in the Houses of Parliament, in front of the Prime Minister and other MPs and other dignitaries, three videos were shown Two of them were from major vegan companies here in the UK. And then little old me with my little business up in the northeast of England, I was chosen. Now, I shouldn't really be surprised. I know why they featured me above other businesses. It's because I sent a copy of my book to the CEO of the League Against Cruel Sports. This is what a book can do for you. It can get you get your movement your message your mission out there in a very big way in the fastest amount of time so some of the um, high profile clients i'm working with you may recognize mark huberman from the national health association and um, he is the uh, ceo of the the oldest plant-based organization certainly in america it might be worldwide it's been going for 75 years um, so we expect Mark to be published by January of next year. You may also recognize this amazing lady, Renee, from Rowdy Girl Sanctuary. Um, she is, well, her book is actually just finished going through editing. We're looking to publish her book by the beginning of October. However, as I said, I like to work with everybody, not just high profile people. People like Mark and Renee, they have huge followings and they want to make a global impact. But there's also people like Tiffany who sent me this um, just a, a few weeks ago, just in about three weeks ago. And Tiffany, if you remember, this is a lady who all she wants is just the nearest and dearest to listen to her. So she wrote to me while I was on vacation, I passed my book out during my family reunion and my closest family members felt obligated to listen to my audiobook. I help people do their audiobook as well as their physical book. They said I did a really good job with narrating and they're encouraging me to start a YouTube channel and make content. These are the family members I wrote the book for. And apparently I did a really good job because after my brother listened to the book, he texted me and asked me what kind of plant milk I drink, LOL. He even told me he wouldn't have cared if the book was about animal suffering since he doesn't care about that. And I told him that's why I wrote the book the way I did. I wrote it for them and it seems I nailed it. He's even recommending it to his friends and doctor. 
for me, that is as big as someone like Renee messaging me and saying, thank God this book is coming together. Because I believe activism, activism happens at all levels. It can happen, happen on a global level, but also it happens on a personal and familial level as well. Um, and that's why I urge everybody to write books wherever you are, because that's the way to get people to really listen to your story. You've got, you know, Tiffany, who's been trying to speak to her family for many years about the benefits of a plant-based diet and being dismissed until she wrote a book. So quickly go through, my goal is to help as many vegan and ethical experts as possible put their mission, movement and message on the map. I know that is the, the fastest way to get people into the media so more and more people hear our message. My mission is to amplify the voices of vegan ethical leaders globally, so the screams to end the exploitation of animals, humans, and the environment will become too loud to be ignored. And my dream is to die in a vegan normal world. I'm gonna be 45 in four weeks time. I know that's not old, that's not young either. So I'm about midway through my life. And my goal is to, well, my dream is to die in a vegan normal world. And this is my activism. If I can help as many vegan, plant-based, ethical people write books, get on the right platforms and get people to listen that we need to go vegan ASAP, as in yesterday, we needed to go vegan, then hopefully I'll be able to die in a vegan normal world. So I just wanted to give you an overview because there's going to be people here like, I don't know who this woman is. Why should I listen to her and her publishing tips? Okay, so let's get into the vegan publishing tips. Now, once upon a time, actually, um, I would say just uh, just 20 years ago, there was a time there was only one way of publishing a book. Okay, and that was through a publishing house. Now you have the major ones, they're still the major ones. We call them the big five. There's Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, Macmillan, Simon Schuster, and Hashit. They also have smaller divisions as well, which operate as separate publishing houses, but part of them. There's loads of them. You even, have, you even have specialist publishing houses in the medical field, in the legal field, in the political field, et cetera. But there was literally only one way to publish your book. And that was you needed a publisher, a traditional publisher. And they were the gatekeepers. OK, you submitted your manuscript. If they liked it, hurrah. If they didn't, well, there you go. Do you know what I mean, they were the gatekeepers. They had ultimate say on what books are published. And that is because they had relationships. They had long standing relationships with bookstore owners, for example, the CEO of Bonds and Noble they would know. They would know the CEO of Waterstones, that's the biggest book retailer here in the UK, Angus and Robertson um, in Australia, and all over the world, if you think of all the major bookstores, these publishers would have relationships with them. And crucially, they would also have relationships with libraries, i.e. governments, um, senators even, um, MPs here in the UK, they would have those relationships with them. And because of that, they were all powerful, okay? So you could come into this world and if you had a great manuscript, even if you had no audience, no one had ever heard from you before, if somebody inside a publisher liked you, then they could open doors for you. They can find your audience because they have these relationships. And then in 2004, it all fell apart. Almost overnight, it came crashing down because of these guys. I'm sure you've heard of them. They're huge. Amazon came in around about 2004, and by 2005, they had completely destroyed centuries of publishing. Because what Amazon did is they came in and said, well, we have a platform, and you can use our platform. So if you're the CEO of Penguin Random House, feel free to put your books on our platform. If you're a single mother of two in the middle of America and they've never published before, guess what? You can still use our platform and stick your book on it. We don't care. They completely level the playing field because they didn't care about relationships. They just said, we have an open platform. You publish whatever you want to do and that's cool by us. And depending on who buys what, that's great. They just didn't care. With this very different business model, they completely changed they completely changed the world of publishing to the point now that publishing houses really are just now banks. That's how I see them as. They are banks. And this is probably the most important thing for you to remember. Okay. 
let me give you some statistics and why this has happened. Amazon now has about half the market share worldwide for print books. Barnes and Nobles, which is the biggest offline bookstore in the world, only has a fifth. Okay, so half of all print books sold in the world are through Amazon. Everyone else shares the other 50%. When you move to ebooks, Amazon's share jumps to 84%. Barnes and Nobles has just 2%. Everybody else has less than 1%. So you can see how huge Amazon now is. Amazon hovers around $1 trillion market cap. Okay, one trillion dollar, whereas Barnes and Nobles, let me just move this down. Barnes and Nobles is around 475 million, which is just 0.05% of Amazon. Because of this, all of those relationships that traditional publishers had, they don't mean anything anymore now. The biggest retailer of books worldwide, by far, by a landslide, is Amazon, who don't really care who you are, whether you're the CEO of a major publisher or whether you're just you on your own self-publishing, they really, really don't care. And that is why you have to see traditional publishers now as they're more banks. It's a place for them to actually pay you to write a book as opposed to self-publishing when you need to do that yourself. So let's quickly, why is this not moving? There we go. Let me quickly go through and by the way, if you're, I can see some people scribbling down notes, you can do that, but I can make my slides available. So I'll speak to the powers that be so you can have my slides and then that way um, you're not missing anything while you're scribbling things down, okay? So traditional publishing or self-publishing, which one should you go for? So traditional publishing, they will pay for all your costs. That's a really, really good pro. That's a, that's a winning thing. They will pay for editing and cover design and typesetting, which is wonderful. You don't have to pay. Downside of self-publishing, you need to pay for an editor. You need to pay for a cover designer, typesetter. It usually, if you want to do it to a professional standard, you'd run to several thousand dollars or pounds, okay? With a traditional publisher, they will pay for it. With a traditional publisher, you will know that your book is published to a professional standard because they've got skin in the game. Remember what I was saying before about traditional publishers? They're like a bank now. Basically, what they're doing is they're lending you money to go and write your book. They'll pay for editing and cover design and typesetting, et cetera, et cetera. The goal is they will um, make more than enough money back to pay themselves back and turn a profit by selling your book. So they've got skin in the game. They have to make sure the book is at a professional standard. With self-publishing, you're not sure you unless you know people in the industry or you've been in the book industry yourself you have no idea if your book is at a professional standard or whether it's not there's prestige attached to as well if you get a major publisher or even a small publisher but in a niche say for example you're a doctor writing in the medical field there are two or three publishers small publishers within the medical field that everyone in the medical sector knows so there's a prestige attached to being published through a publisher. There's no prestige attached to self-publishing. Some cons now of traditional publishing. Well, of course, they have paid for all of your costs. So therefore you can expect that they will take a lion's share of the profits of the book. You will receive around six to 10%. They will take 90% or more which is all, like I said, fair enough when they've paid, they're paying themselves back. Just like a bank pays themselves back when they lend you money for a house, you pay the monthly repayments and they make more money through the interest. So in the same way, you will only get 60-10% royalties. With self-publishing, however, you keep 100% of your profits. It's your book. Also, you will lose rights to your book through traditional publishing. Again, just like a bank, if you buy a house, and you got yourself a mortgage or a loan to buy the house, if you don't keep up your payments, your house will be taken off you because the house doesn't actually belong to you until you've made the final payment, yeah? It's the same thing with your book. Until the end of the contract, the publisher owns the rights to your book. So if you wanna make any changes to your book, it's only if it benefits them will they say yes. Otherwise they may, may well say no and you can do nothing about mm -hmm. it because ultimately they own the book. With self-publishing, however, you keep all the rights to your book, so you can make changes whenever you want. 
And the other con, now this is a con of both self-publishing and traditional publishing. You'll notice with everything else, the pros of traditional publishing are the cons of self-publishing and vice versa, yeah? But the two things, which is a con of both of them, is that you need to have an audience. You need to have an audience. Now, this is the most important slide. If you don't remember anything else, just remember this slide, okay? I've had so many authors come to me and tell me they've been burnt by a traditional publisher because the reason they went to a traditional publisher and they didn't self-publish is because they thought with a traditional publisher, they will market the book for them. They don't market the book for them, okay? Doesn't matter whether you self-publish or you go through a traditional publishing route. You basically need to find your own audience, okay? The only difference with a traditional publisher is they will pay for your costs and there's some prestige attached to it if it's a major publisher. But either way, you need to build your own audience, okay? Now, there's me. I like my Bitmoji, by the way. You'll see my little cartoon face everywhere. Um, a lot of people do ask me, well, what do you do then? How do you, what, what do you do in this world? Well, my goal is to bridge the gap between traditional publishing and self-publishing, okay? So I help people go through a traditional publisher or if they want to self-publish. See, if they want to self-publish by having someone like me on board, one of the cons, if you remember, was you're unsure if your book is published to a professional standard. I have a team of editors, cover designers, typesetters, all ethical vegans, by the way, and all consummate professionals. We've worked in this industry for decades, so we can make sure that your book is published to a professional standard, even though it'll be self-published. So if you're choosing self-publishing, you're still going to make sure that your book is published to a professional standard. There's some prestige attached as well. I've published 29 authors. I'm working with 57 at the moment. Do I have the same standing as someone like Harper Collins or Penguin Random House? Of course I don't. I've been going since 2018. Penguin Random House has been going since the 1930s. So I've got a long way to catch up with those guys. But I've built up quite a good reputation, especially within the vegan, plant-based, ethical world. So you have some prestige. So even though you're self-publishing, you do it underneath the vegan publisher. So therefore there's some prestige attached as well. And also I have PR and marketing experts within my team who can help you with your book, use it to build your brand. So I bridge the gap there. I can help you self-publish so you keep 100% of your profits and you keep all your rights to your book, but you're not completely going it alone. Yeah, you're not completely going it alone. You know that your book is going to be published to a professional standard and you're going to get help building your audience. OK, so if you sat there and thought, OK, I think I want to self-publish. Let me go through quickly. And again, I will get slides to you so you don't have to worry about writing it down. But let me go through quickly um, the best ways to self-publish. So print on demand is the best way to self-publish. It means it, the, the books are only printed when people have bought the book. What you don't want to do is buy thousands of books, take up loads of storage space and be sending the books out yourself. What if something happens? What if there's a fire? What if there's flooding? I know somebody who lost over $6,000 worth of books because she was storing them in her garage and it flooded. Last thing you want to do. So print on demand is fantastic because basically you just upload the file somewhere and then that company prints the book out as and when people order it, okay? So you'll be happy to know that Amazon KDP use vegan inks and glues. They've confirmed that for me in the US and the UK and, and Canada. I'm still waiting for them to confirm in Australia and other parts of the world, but certainly in the UK, USA and Canada, they use vegan inks and glues. However, they don't use recycled paper. Very frustrating. I have one of, one of my assistants, one of her jobs is monthly to annoy Amazon and send them the same email asking why they don't use recycled paper. So we're going to keep doing that and annoy them until they start using recycled paper. Lulu.com, another great platform, print on demand platform. They also use vegan inks and glues. Unfortunately, they also don't use recycled paper. Very, very frustrating. And one of my assistants does email them every month to annoy them into starting using recycled paper. Ingram Spark, a big print on demand um, platform, unfortunately does not use vegan inks and glues, which I hate. And one of my assistants emails them, I think every two weeks and just annoys them. And hopefully one day they will listen to us and start using vegan inks and glues. And sadly, they don't use recycled paper. Now you're probably thinking, well, why did you put Ingram Spark in this list? Bearing in mind you're vegan. 
The reason why Ingram Spark is in this list is this is the major print on demand uh, publisher that bookstore owners use to go and get their books. So unfortunately, I have to use them. My book is actually available on Ingram Spark. I don't use them. It's only literally when a bookstore wants my book in their stores, they go to Ingram Spark. And it really irritates me that my book on vegan and ethics and vegan marketing is using vegan inks and glues. It makes me a little bit sick to my stomach, but it's trying, you know, you all know what I'm talking about here. Trying to be vegan in a non-vegan world. Sometimes you, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place and you kind of have to, you know, go with what you believe is the lesser of the two evils. So unfortunately I do have to keep using Ingram Spark, but I am annoying them every two weeks and hopefully they will listen to me soon. Vegan printers. These are people that you want, if you want to do a bulk buy, go to veganprinter.com. They're based in LA. They are amazing. If anybody here wants an introduction to them, let me know. These guys will do your books. So they will do, I think the minimum order is only 50 books or is it a hundred? But if you want to do a bulk buy of your books, do go there. They also do everything else. If you want to do t-shirts, you want to do banners, if you want to do business cards, anything, and it's completely vegan, which is wonderful. Here in the UK, we have dcslondon.com. They are, these are the people who do my books whenever I do a bulk buy. They also do my t-shirts, my branded mugs, everything that I do uh, for my business. And again, completely vegan and recycled paper as well, completely sustainable. Now, if any of you here know um, vegan printers in Canada, in Australia and other parts of the world, please let me know because I want to grow this list and let everybody know about these amazing people. So I only know these two, USA and UK, but if you know others in other parts of the world or indeed in the UK or USA, please let me know. So that is what you should do with self-publishing. Now say you go, no, I want to go with a traditional publisher. I looked at your pros and cons and I worked out that a traditional publisher works well for me because they will pay for my costs and they will give me prestige. Um, but remember, you need to have an audience. So that's a key thing. If you have an audience, say you've built up a small following via email or on Instagram or TikTok, then there is a case for you to go to a traditional publisher. So these are the vegan ones. OK, so there's BenBellaVegan.com. They've been around for a while. Their real big thing is, and understandable, is they publish T. Colin Campbell who I had the privilege of meeting a few weeks ago. It's a pinch me moment that I actually met T. Colin Campbell and actually knows who I am. But they published him 20, over 20 years ago now. Um, and they publish books on veganism as well as cookbooks, but also ethics and that sort of thing. There's lanternpm.org. Um, also, they do books on veganism, ethics, spirituality as well. There's Vegan Heritage Press. They mainly focus on cookbooks and books helping people transition into veganism. And then there's veganpublishers.com who do everything under the vegan, vegan umbrella. So those are the four traditional publishers within the vegan world that I know of that are brilliant and they're great at what they do. The key thing to remember is that you need to have an audience. Now, what I do, that's me doing my woohoo again, and what I do within this field is I help people who've decided they want to traditionally publish. I help them create an amazing book proposal. OK, and um, because a lot of people still believe, sadly, that to get a traditional publisher interested in you, you've got to have an amazing book idea. OK, that's how it was 20 years ago. Remember, I showed you that slide before Amazon. That's how it was 20 years ago. If somebody liked your book because of the relationships that they had with libraries and, and major bookstores, you were set. Now, because Amazon turned up in 2004 and completely leveled the playing field, now it doesn't, that's just not how it works. Now, what a book publisher will look for is audience first, book idea second. I know that's sad and I, it upsets me, but your book idea is not as important as you demonstrating that you have an audience. Think about it from a publish, pu publisher's point of view. Put yourself into their shoes, okay? So if you're going to spend, say, $6,000 on editing, cover design, typesetting, all these professionals to get a book done, you need to make sure that you're going to at least get your $6,000 back and hopefully more so you can actually turn a profit. Now, would you go to author A who has a mediocre book idea but has an audience of 10,000? And you think, okay, the idea, the book idea is pretty terrible. But, you know, 
we can talk to them and maybe massage their ideas and make it better than it needs to be. Or would it, or would you go with author B who has an incredible book idea, but no audience? You're gonna go sadly with author A, even though, though the, their book idea is very mediocre, you can just say, well, we can talk to them and we can make the idea better. We can add things to it, but they have an audience that we can sell the book to. So that's what I do with any of my clients who decide that traditional publishing is the way forward for, for them. We create an amazing proposal where we look at things like marketing, we look at things like audience reach, what kind of social media following you have, what kind of email list you have, and we create the best proposal to make it interesting and commercially viable for a publisher to green light you and say, yes, we'll publish your book. Because I mean, these guys, for example, Ben Bella Vegan, they're amazing people. They're there because they want to create books that change people's attitudes. But ultimately, they still need to turn a profit or even if they're a nonprofit, they need to make sure they don't go out of business. So they have to think of what is commercially viable and not just what is a great book idea. And that's what I do. I help people create book proposals that make people go, yes, we need to green light this, green light this book idea. So this is one of my most recent clients who's got a publisher. Some of you may know her, Dr. Angela Crawford. So she shared this with me just a few weeks ago. Just wanted to share the exciting news that I have a publishing contract for my book after soul searching about what publishing route I wanted to go, as well as talking over with various mentors, including Mitali, I decided to submit a book proposal to Lantern Publishing this spring. Lantern specializes in vegan, humane, education, spiritual, and social justice orientated books. To my great excitement, my proposal was accepted and I recently signed the contract, so it is official. My due date for turning in my completed manuscript is early 2024, and I have a lot to do in order to meet my goal. So very pleased for Angela. She is going through a traditional publishing route. But yes, this is what we need to show these publishers that you're commercially viable. So I'm going to leave you with this. I don't really care where you are, whether you are a global leader or have aspirations to be a global leader and a voice for the voiceless and you really want to change people's attitude when it comes to what they're doing with, to the planet, or whether you just have much smaller goals and that you just want to convince your nearest and dearest, your, your, lo your local, your neighborhood, your neighbors, your, you know, your local council or whatever it is that you want to do. I want you to amplify your voice. I don't care whether you're someone like Mark, who has a huge reach around the world, or whether you're someone like Tiffany, who just wants her nearest and dearest to listen to her and not kill themselves early by eating the horrible foods that they're eating. Um, either way, I need you to amplify your voice for a selfish reason, because I want to die in a vegan normal world. I'm not going to die in a vegan normal world if voices don't get louder and we don't get out there and tell people that what they're doing to animals, to themselves and to the planet is completely wrong so if anything you've heard today has made you think i want to write a book but i've got no idea how to go about it i don't know whether i want to self-publish i don't know whether i want to go down the traditional publishing route i don't know where the hell to start get in touch with me you can go to the veganpublisher.com forward slash vcop and i will give you free of charge a 30-minute consultation i normally charge 97 dollars for like a brainstorming consultation but because I know I'm in a group of amazing people who, well, you're here at VCOP, so you're already taking a stand, you know. Um, I all say I meet lots of vegans and I've just been at Vegan Camp Out, the biggest uh, vegan festival in the world. Um, and I met so many amazing vegans. But there is this belief with a lot of vegans is that as long as I'm not doing anything bad, as long as I'm not eating animals, as long as I'm not testing on animals and it's OK. You know, I've come out of it. And I think we all go through that process as a vegan. We abstain. But then some of us evolve beyond that. And we realize that abstaining is not enough. It's a bit like watching someone getting assaulted and saying, well, I'm not assaulting them, so it's OK. Well, no, it's not OK. You need to do something about it. In the same way, we start off as we'll just abstain. We'll just won't get involved with the torture of animals. We won't get involved with the degradation of the planet. And then some of us evolve beyond that and say, no, that's not enough. We really need to get our voices heard and convince other people. I know I'm in a room full of people just like that because you're here at VCOP. So for you guys, 
no charge at all. We can have a brainstorming session. Just go to the veganpublisher.com forward slash review cop and then you can book yourself in and have a, a 30 minute brainstorming session with me. And that's it. Any questions? I think we've still got another 10 minutes, I believe. I'll stop sharing. Tremendous appreciation for what you just shared, Tali. Thank, Thank you so you. much. My voice didn't go. I'm so happy. I'm sweating. <laughs> up. Can you see? I'm sweating COVID sweats. Brilliant. You know, but, uh... <laughs> well, I hope you feel better soon. I, I wasn't going to miss this, Silas. There was absolutely no way, unless I was in a, I was lying in bed and couldn't get out. There was no way because I, I love VCOP. I love what what you've put together, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to come be around the other sessions. I've been in bed this whole weekend. Oh no! <laughs> There's <laughs> one yeah. question people are asking: Would you like yes. to live in a vegan, normalized world, not just die in it? You're absolutely right, but I, I think. Yeah. We have a big job in front of us. I hope I, I would love it. Well, we need to go, we need to be vegan in 2026. Yeah. But um Good. my fear, Sarish, is I'm not sure if we're going to be able to, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, I just sometimes, you. yeah, yeah. It, it just feels like there's so there's so many vested interests against us. You know, until mm -hmm. that changes, until basically governments stop subsidizing animal agriculture, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, and that worries me. So then my goal changed to if I die in a vegan normal world, I'm happy. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> we'll talk some more about that. <laughs> yes, yes, we will. We will. Um, okay, we have questions. Okay, so we've got Reverend Beth Love and we've got Watch Dominion. I don't know who was first, but we've got two people with their hands up. Yeah, Reverend Betla, and then watch. Yes. Let me add you to that. Thank you so much, Mitali. Really, really appreciated that. I've been looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, so I have a question. I, um, I have my second book kind of all ready to go, except for some things that I just... Um, I'm just struggling to get to. So my question is, you know, do you, one of the things is I want to find somebody to write the foreword who has, um, who has a, uh, who's vegan, but who has a bigger, uh, a bigger following than veganism, who, because I, I really want to reach non-vegans. That's the whole purpose of writing. Um, so I wonder if you connect people with, you know, like if you help people, um, your, your authors get, um, people to write blurbs or to write forwards, things like that. So yeah, absolutely. And it's 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 a very um it's a shrewd move. I did that with my book. Um, uh, because when I became, you know, I founded the vegan publisher, no one knew about me in that world. You know, I've been vegan personally since 2012, but it had nothing to do with my business. I was a writer and a ghostwriter, and I just did that separately. Um, so I thought, well, how do I, you know, how do I really make a big splash within the vegan ethical world? So I don't know if you know her, Katrina Fox. She's quite well known. Yeah. So I got her to write my forward, <laughs> you know, so it's a very, it's a great way. I can probably get Katrina to write you a forward as well. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Let's talk. Um, okay. and, and yeah, that's a very, it's a, it's a key way. Get somebody who's got a bigger audience than you to write your forward. And then you've now got people who are going to come to you. So yeah, that's a really, really good way okay. of doing it. Great. And then my second question has to do with the, the size of the following. Um, to get I I I'm seriously sad to hear that Ingram Spark doesn't uh, use vegan glue. They they are the print on demand company I used for my first book, and um, the reason I used them was that they I didn't want to use Amazon, and then also I know uh, talk about being stuck between so people use Ingram Spark because like Amazon is not sustainable. The ethics are terrible of that business. You know, it's just so capitalist. And right. then they find out that Ingram Spark doesn't use, and Amazon does use vegan inks and glues. It's stuck between a rock and a hard place most of the time. Well, and then the other thing about Ingram Spark is at least they use um, paper that's forest stewardship certified. So like yes. there's, you know, it's like the only print on demand company I could find that did that. So mm -hmm. I, I just, based on your talk, I'm seriously considering maybe I should get a publisher 
Um, so how big of a following Do, does it need to be thousands and thousands or no no it it really I, I, unfortunately I can't give you an answer to that Beth I wish I could it depends on the publisher so a major five publisher like Hashit for example um, or Harper Collins they I mean Harper Collins have been known to troll through Instagram and TikTok and give publishing deals to influencers who don't even want to write a book. I've got a couple of friends who are big TikTok influencers and they get hounded by Harper Collins. To write. They've got no interest in writing a book, by the way, <laughs> but because they've got, you know, over a hundred thousand followers, they're basically throwing publishing deals at these people who don't even want to write a book. And then there's people who've got something to say who can't get a publishing deal. It's mm -hmm. a sad state of affairs, but that mm -hmm. is just how it is. So it doesn't, it's more to do with you being commercially viable. See, if you have a small publisher, you may just have an email list of say a thousand people. But if those a thousand people are people that you can count on to buy your book, that could be enough for that publisher to go, okay, they'll do their costs and they'll work out how much it's gonna cost them for editing, cover design, typesetting to get your book published. And then they will do the maths and then they will work out, okay, we can make this amount of money back. It's worth it, mm -hmm. you know? And this is what I, I said before, that try and see publishing houses now as a bank. So what you're doing is you're, they're lending you money to essentially make more money back. So just mm -hmm. like with if you go to a bank and you want to get a loan, they will do credit checks and make sure you're good to pay them back. That's, that's what publishing houses are doing. Okay? okay. But I can't tell you, oh, you need a thousand or 10,000 or a million followers. It depends on the publisher. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I thank I'm, you. Uh, I will definitely make an appointment and thank you for offering free um, free consult. Of course, of course. Thank you, Debbie. Watch. Uh, watch. Oh yes, uh, thanks, Mithali. Uh, the, that's a great, great talk. My question is, you know, as with the newspapers in the era of print publishing, uh, as is evident in print newspapers, is, is fast declining. I haven't bought a print book in ages. And it, I mean, I do, I do support the publishers, especially the vegan publishers. And I, um, so most of the times, first in line to buy their, buy their books, but I want to support them. But I think, like you mentioned in your talk yourself, that the era is shifting towards like blogging and, and also from a operational standpoint, if we want to have a vegan world, we, we need people to be blogging about it rather than waiting for a couple of years to get their, get their book, book published. So how do you see the marketplace changing? Because you know, a, lot of, in fact, a lot of people are getting their news and information from on, online rather than buying these print media. So how do you think the, the business is changing? Uh, the business has changed. It's not changing. It's it's completely changed. And I'm trying to remember the last time I bought a newspaper or a magazine. I don't actually remember. It must be several years ago. Um, so it's completely changed. However, in terms of remember what I talked about my size, it's not really about. It's about getting visibility. OK, and the more we move online, the more. If you think about it, most of us now really do consume most of our information online, whether it's blogs, whether it's social media posts, um, whether it's news sites, we're actually getting it online. We're not getting offline. But the more we move online, the more we value the offline. Because as, as human beings, we are designed to see something that's where we see a lot of it, where we see abundance, we kind of go, oh, it's every day, it's common. Where we see less of something, that becomes precious. There's a reason why diamonds are so precious. They're not actually really all that beautiful. I actually prefer sapphires, to be honest, to diamonds. But diamonds are because they're so rare, and that is why they're so valuable. So I've noticed that as we get more into the online world, authors are more revered. Now, that doesn't mean you should stop blogging. I mean, as you're absolutely right, what you said, when it comes to people consuming content people are moving more and more online but the book is what gives you authority think of how you treat i think of how people treat someone who's a professionally published author 
as opposed to a blogger. And the wonderful thing is a lot of my authors who have blogs, they use the content that's in the book in their blogs. So it's not even they're having to choose between one another. They're using blogs as a way to get the message out there. But then they have a professionally published book. And that is the thing that's getting them into the print media. And the print media isn't for really, it's not really a case of, well, how many people are going to pick up a newspaper? It's more the visibility you get for saying, I've been in the Financial Times, or I've been in the Guardian, I've been in the New York Times. That's why the mileage is. How many people actually read the article is not even all that important. It's the fact that you can say you are on this and that then gets you onto bigger platforms. I've got onto major podcasts by saying, hey, I've been featured on Veg Economist. I don't actually know how many people read my article in Veg Economist. It doesn't really matter. It's the fact that I can now say I was published on Veg Economist. I've been published on Plant Based News. And I can use that and leverage that to get on bigger online platforms. Does that make sense, Watch? It's not really a case of, one or the other, the whole thing feeds into one big thing, which is all about getting on the biggest platforms and letting the world know we need to go vegan by 2026, according to, to Dr. Sahesh. So we, that's what we need to do. It's I don't see it as um, either or. It all feeds into the same thing, which is we need to get our voices out there. And we need people to take us seriously and listen to us. So the, the, that's the point which I'm trying to make is that a counter argument be, between publishing rather than microblogging. I see from my perspective, the world moving towards microblogging, like writing to the newspaper, writing on New York Times Post, so, so to speak, and using their momentum to have the word out rather than waiting for a couple of years to having your, your book book published. And, and, I, and I see, and I, I'm, I totally see that advantage and importance, but if we really want to get the message across, we need to be microblogging. Yeah, but you're still saying it's like one or the other. And I'm saying, why are you choosing one or the other? Again, <laughs> because you're, you're not being forced to make a choice watch. You're forcing yourself to make a choice that you don't even need to make. You can have the whole buffet here. The whole media buffet is yours <laughs> for the taking if you want it. I'm not stopping you. Question online is, uh, <laughs> how do you prove you have a viable audience? Now, that's a good one. Well, I mean, some people say we'll do it in followers, for example. But mm. even then, it's it's a difficult one because I, I know people who have small email lists of one, 2,000 people but they're a very active email list. You know, they open every single email that person sends and they love them. Then there's people with tens of thousands of followers. But when you look at the engagement, it's like at 1% or 2%. So it's difficult. And this is what, this is what if you want to go down a traditional publishing route, this is what I help people do. I help people create a proposal. And then we try to find those marketing points. So if someone's got huge following, guess what we say? Well, this person's got 56,000 followers on Instagram. But if someone has less than that, then we have to say, okay, we now need to market it on engagement. So what kind of engagement do you have? So this is all about putting, it is marketing and advertising, by the way. You think about when you write your CV, like hopefully none of you lie on your CV, but you do massage things a little bit to put your the best, that's what we do. That's what a book proposal is. It's basically like a CV and you have to put yourself and your book in the best possible light. Right. Angela? You were still Hello. muted. Then. Okay. Oh, good. Mm. Thank you. Hi, guys. How are you? Yeah, so um, I'm, I love the, uh, the talk about this, uh, Mitali. Um, this is my first time actually here. And uh, I'm... It's like it like bombs pop up on my head. Like, oh my gosh, this it's like God send. You're God send. Oh, <laughs> this is thank what you. I want to really do is to have like, someone. It made, it, it's, this has made it worth getting out of bed. I'm gonna go. Back yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it feels like um like <laughs> you're you. you're talking like about you know what I really want to do is to have a book, and like even just to, for my family to understand what i i've been telling them about my sister had the seizures since since she was 10 months old she needs to like kind of 
go on more plant-based um, lifestyle so that way she can relieve that seizure and so you know what you're talking about like just to write a book for your family or you know for someone like you know just the community that would be good so how how do I go about on starting because I'm, I'm you know I've never dealt with <laughs> book writing or um, I mean I have a Facebook and Instagram and I, I dealt with TikTok but I'm not really a content person type <laughs> you know to just get it all out there and stuff like that so even writing simple things it's like I don't know where to start <laughs> you know it's fine I mean that's that's what I do I mean I have some people who come to me with a fully formed idea they just mm -hmm. need it gestating and there's some people like you who will come to me and say I've got no idea where to start I don't even I'm not even sure what my idea is can you help I me don't. and then yeah. we we work it out so just book yourself in we can have a half an hour brainstorming session and uh -huh. by the end of it you should have a at least a rough idea of where what the next steps are so just book yourself in um and yeah I look forward to to having a chat with you when I'm better obviously but um yeah book yourself in um yeah let's talk you remind me a lot of Tiffany who I who I mentioned you know she uh, when she first came to you she surprised me because she's just like well yeah I don't have a brand I'm not really I'm not really interested in in becoming some sort of figurehead for the plant-based movement or anything like that but you know she was born legally blind and uh, with congenital mm. defects in the heart and the kidneys and she was told that she probably won't live after the age of 40 and she turned everything around by going plant-based despite that her family still didn't want to listen to her even though she was walking around healthier now than she was when she was a baby mm -hmm. they still didn't want to listen to her until she published a book she ended up on chef aj's show and suddenly now oh, they, wow. want to and they want to know what plant-based milk she drinks. Awesome. And it just wow. drives me, it drives me crazy. It's like, this is your family. They know how ill you were. Surely mm -hmm. that should be enough. But people are like that. People, and this is what, this goes back to, uh, back to what Watch was saying regarding books versus the online world. It's not a, an either or. The online world is fantastic for reach because that is where people are consuming content. But the more we move online, the more authors are respected because everyone can stick up a blog. Everyone has Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. How many are professionally published authors? So, and this yeah. is what I mean, going back to what you can do both. You can use the online mm -hmm. world for reach and then the book is for authority. And in your case, hopefully your family will listen to you, Angela, when they see you're a professionally published author, like, oh my God, she's actually serious. Yeah, I actually, I, I'm actually thinking of um, different books, basically, because the reason why I got into being plant-based is because of that, my sister, and then the diseases that's going to come up eventually. I'm going to be turning 40 this year, so <laughs> I got to keep up with that, the health, and plus I used to sell vegetable when I was 14 years old. So I, I wanted someone to tell that story. When I was younger, I supported my family by selling vegetables and fruits in the, the streets, you know, so that's another. Oh, wow, that is I, a story. Uh, <laughs> I don't know you how to must talk. put that in the book, but it, it is like, so it's kind of like God's leading me into this, you know, go back to the, you know, when you were 14 years old. You, you know, you know, vegetables and fruits and advocate that to people. And uh, I've been, I've been whole food plant-based for two years and uh, it's well done. It got me, it, I lost like 31 pounds plus the exercise and stuff like that. So that's another thing. So it's an, it's an, like another book, <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, that probably needs to go into the, the one book. That needs to be in the introduction. You always should explain to people why they need to. That's why I did that in my slides. I could have just gone straight into publishing tips. But some of you who don't know me will be like, who the hell is this woman? And why Why should I listen to her? Where, how is she an authority yeah. on this? So you have to talk a little bit, a bit about you before you mm -hmm. start giving the advice. Otherwise, the advice doesn't land. Yeah. And, and then now my husband, actually, we, we own a, a, well, he owned a personal training studio. So that's another story that I needed to put out there because um, he, he started this, uh, you know, gig. He's been at 20 years in the fitness industry, but all of his friends here in this community were here, but nobody really comes to actually exercise and train with him. 
So because he was like known as a party person back in the day and like nothing serious, you know, now that he's like a personal trainer, certified personal trainer, nobody wants to come. <laughs> I was like, my gosh, like if they just know who you really are now, then maybe they'll, you know, they'll, they'll come and, but it's like, they don't take them seriously. So I think a book would help him to put out that story and his back issues. That's why he became like a personal trainer. He studied the anatomy and all that. So, and he's actually yeah. kind of slowly going onto the plant-based because of me. He, you know, they're, they're still eating sad diet, but you know, as I role model right now, they're, you know, like my son eliminates the ground beef and all that when he goes to events. <laughs> Most of the events in the community actually has like standard American diet and, and it kind of upsets me as, mm. you know, as I go with this journey with the whole food plant-based. Most, like I've seen, I, we've, been, we've been living here for three years and most events, like even the churches, the community events, it's all like about animal consumption. And it's just... Angela, we are running oh out of God. time. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. I did yeah. apologize. You, yeah. Just make sure okay. you, you book your half an hour with me because I've got a funny feeling we've got yeah. a lot to talk about. It. So make Let's sure you book. I, get I the raised last question. my hand. Okay. Angela, your story is inspiring and awesome. I know. And I'm I, already excited. And I just want to encourage up. everybody that has the desire to write to continue to follow your dream. I can't wait to connect with you, Mitali, because you have such a strong background in publishing and, and knowing journalism and everything. My background was food. And then later in life, I started to learn publishing and I went to my community college. If anyone wants to be proficient in writing, I would encourage you to use the free services that our schools are offering. I trained in Adobe Creative Cloud without any cost and got certificates in that. And now it's like learning how to fly a plane. And in publishing, they use that term pre-flight check, right? Before you get ready to push your book out there, the yeah. pre-flight check. So um, I've been working on it during our presentation here, but I wanted to also mention Watch. It's a, you know, the publishing, the micro blogging and everything. Yes, it's taken me years to write this cookbook. But in the meantime, um, I've been doing things like writing letters to community leaders. I'm not comfortable that much doing a lot of social media just out there. Uh, my Facebook account has been hacked twice. I get people that send me likes that I don't know who they are and they make odd comments. It's really kind of an awkward situation, but I am good at writing press releases and getting on the news, at sending things to community leaders. And another writing experience that any of us can try in our own neighborhoods, my local grocery store just a block and a half from here sends out a weekly newsletter with promotions, right? Well, I kept getting these recipes, all kinds of meat recipes, and I would write back and say, hey, there's a substitute for this, or maybe you could consider publishing that. And I would send funny vegan humor memes and talk about people's new way of thinking. And the store owner finally called me into his office and he said, come see me in my office. And he said, would you be willing to write a weekly recipe column for our newsletter? And I'll provide all the groceries. You come in, you're going to have a deadline of Mondays. And every Monday we're going to submit a recipe and it will go in the Thursday thing, 10 days later. I published over 200 recipes with my local grocer. And all I had to do was ask for the opportunity. And it gave me some credentials, you know, being a weekly recipe columnist or whatever. And then the content building was an, a wonderful experience. So anyway, I'm working on this book called Black Belt and Tofu, and it has an exam with it to earn your Black Belt and Tofu too. It's called Black Belt and Tofu, today's plant-based protein-rich alternative to meat, seafood, eggs, and dairy. So it's really kind of like four books in one, and it's almost 300 pages, but I'm starting to finally send out chunks of my work to my local friend who's my copy editor to go over it for me before I send it out to friends for review. So I'm working on it. I'm making my dreams come true 
by stepping up to the plate every day, no matter how long it takes or how hard the journey is, if you want to get it done and you think you have something to share, Matali, you know, you just keep going, right? You follow your dream and you manifest that project and opportunities will come. So thank you all for being the inspiration for me this morning and being here. I'm so grateful to you all. Thank you. Can't wait to connect. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mitali. Love your energy. I don't even feel all that ill now. <laughs> <laughs> I know she well, does I, that I to I everyone. I need to go back to bed, though. I'm feeling a bit lightheaded. But thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.